I'm in the middle of my Simpson Desert Crossing, my Land Cruiser. And those of you who have been watching the build of this Land Cruiser will know how much effort I put into it and how much I love my truck. Phase two is now complete. So this video is just about the truck, what I've done to it as part of phase two, and how well all those mods are working. The ensuite shower was in a uh, solid aluminium case, now in a lightweight bag. I preferred the case just a little bit. It was just a little bit easier to open and close, but it was much heavier and it was obviously, you know, gave the item more protection against brushes and things like that. This bag is uh, simpler and lighter and really does the job very well, so I can't really complain. Um, so that's a minor modification to that. And I need fingernails. Because it's time to have a shower now tonight, but we've got a bit of a wind, so I have to get a few tent pigs out and uh, sort that out with a few tent pigs. Wheels and tires. The tires are the BF Goodrich KM3, the new mud terrain that I'm testing. In order to fit them, uh, the wide ones, because I wanted to do a, re a test, an experiment, a difference between wide and narrow, I and mean, I'm in the middle of that right now, I had to increase the, the width of the rims, so I bought ROH alloy rims. They're 16 inch, but they're 8 inch wide to allow for the wider tire. I have six of them two spares on the back, which of course brings me to the spare wheel carrier. Time for a solution on carrying two spare wheels. And I have selected a product that is from South Africa. Not that I think that Australians are not making good rear wheel carriers. It's not that I think that at all. What I do think though, is this is the best one that I've seen. And it happens to come from uh, Cape Town, South Africa, and I w was equipped uh, on a truck that I drove through the Namib in 2016. This is Gobi X's rear wheel carrier. Best I've yet seen. And I thought that is a really interesting look at an old problem because the designers of rear wheel carriers, I don't think they've paid much attention to the design over the last, well, long time really. Not a lot of them have, they've come up with a solution, it works, and now they're producing them. Gobi X in Cape Town, I believe, has looked at it and said, there's a better way. And I agree with them because this is a very, very nice product. The process is basically remove the old bumper uh, after disconnecting all of the electrics, and then take the electrical components from the old bumper, those that will be used in the new bumper, wire it up, then attach the new bumper. But it's interesting that every time this kind of fitment is fitted to a vehicle, one can see the inconsistencies in vehicle manufacturers. Sometimes these things just don't fit. They need a lot of cutting and you know, a lot of work to get them to fit. I've seen it in Land Cruisers, and I've seen it in particularly bad in Land Rover Defenders. But uh, that's why it costs a lot these to make these things not only to make them but the costs to fit them is normally quite high i'm one of these people that tends to change a lot of things so I'll, I'll be given some equipment for the vehicle and i will always look for ways that i can approve it and modify it for my own particular purposes the gobi x rear bumper uh, is supplied with a reversing lamp which fits in there and i think it will agree it looks quite good the one problem with it is that the light they have supplied is as about as bright as a glowworm in a jar. The new position of the wheel will be about here, so we'll obscure the reversing lights on both sides. So it's a good idea to find a solution. But what I've done with the receptacle here, which has kind of a, a mount that uh, is ideal to, uh, to mount uh, this guy, which is my air outlet, which originally was under here on the old bumper. Now, even easier to get to, will be mounted and partially 
protected by um, that recessed mount that was made for the light. So that's what I'm going to do. Ready now to fit the actual wheel carriers themselves. The kit itself consists of the bumper, left and right carriers, tow bar, and then the carrier itself and uh, has an extension on which I can fit accessories. And, well, I'll show you now why I like this design so much. Firstly, there is no grease or oil in this bearing. And it isn't a particularly tight fit. The purpose of that is that if it was a tight fit and it needed oil or grease, after a while, with dust, that oil or grease would turn into grinding paste. So there's nothing in there. All they've done is they've tapered the bearing there and they've tapered the nut here. It's a castle nut which I can lock with a pin, which means adjusting it is very easy. Taking it out and servicing it is very easy. All I have to do is keep that moderately clean. What I do like about this is that every part of it is user serviceable. So for example, to get the, the, the right tension on here, that's too loose. It mustn't be able to move. All it is is a simple matter of making sure that both sides tighten equally to keep the angle right. And the reason why I got it is because I didn't like any of them that I saw in Australia. Because they all have heavy handles that you have to kind of go underneath the, the wheel. Unlike this one, you see, if the, if the wheel is clamped in there, I just have to come down and undo it. I don't have to get below the tire and pull it. And then to push, to push it home, you know, Gwyn really struggled with the others that I had like that. This one, it's a case of just grabbing the handle and pulling it down and then pulling the pin and opening it. They have a fantastic reputation for strength. The way the wheel is, is, is braced against the bottom here, the whole thing is strong. It's, it flexes a little bit, but it's strong. It's all the attention in the right place, in the bar, in the struts, everything. But the actual cradle on which the wheel sits. My original wheel nuts with a, a locking nut don't fit. Very difficult to get a wheel up there. You can't rest a wheel on it, rotate it and slide it onto the bolts. It's, ah, it would be, it's close to perfect. That's quite a big letdown for me, but I still think it's a, it's a great product. I, and I like to, say this because guys at R&D pay some attention to that. It's the last thing to make this brilliant. A ladder. Ladder made by Tracklander as is the roof rack. My motivation for putting a ladder is really that not that I need to get onto the roof very often but I do occasionally set up a tripod film up there. I actually want to sleep up there like I used to do in the Kalahari. I often used to just put out a bedroll on top of an open roof rack and just sleep if the weather was nice and there wasn't a lot of wind. And I, I like the, the, this design of rack too because to, to strap something on it with a bungee or something is really, really quick. So a bit of firewood up there and it's strapped on. I used to just climb on the wheels and uh, I was always a bit worried about slipping off them. So uh, there's my ladder. This is the Javanese rubber plant. It grows on the tiny island of Wiggy Woggy Woggy in the South Pacific. Inside, well, sorry it's a mess, but I'm not going to clean it up for you people. I'm, this is camping, it's real live camping. And I haven't changed it, really, apart from the electrical. That is a unit that I made myself, and the measuring unit I purchased for $10 on eBay. And it doesn't work very well because it doesn't give me uh, a, 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 a final sum. It'll just let me know how much current I'm using, but it doesn't give me a final sum on how much I'm putting back and how much I'm putting in and therefore a sum of whether it's positive or negative. And that I have actually done uh, just before this trip. In fact, uh, in Ipswich near Brisbane, we got together with the guys from GlobalSat and Better Batteries and Heist and they installed an electrical system 
purely a measuring system where I can now measure uh, my battery's performance on my phone. Those of you that have been following the build of this vehicle will know that I put in lead crystal batteries. It's reasonably new technology. And I've been asked many, many times, how well are they doing? How well are they performing? And my answer has always been, well, I think very well, but I'm not actually sure. I'm not actually sure because up to this point, I've had no way of really measuring it. What we're doing now is putting in a piece of equipment that will allow me not only to see live how the batteries are doing, but actually record what's happening. So over a trip I can see exactly, precisely how well these batteries are doing. Because probably the most important part about any dual battery system in a vehicle is not so much how much current can it deliver, but how quickly can it recover when being charged, how fast can the batteries reabsorb, recharge themselves from the systems within the vehicle. This I will now know for sure and be able to report on it. Okay, this is a lead crystal battery, lead crystal battery monitor, LCBM. That sounds like something that's going to re-enter the atmosphere, doesn't it? Lead crystal battery monitor, it uh, has a recording device with an L, a, a memory card built in. I've tried an experiment with these batteries. I wanted to try to push them to the limit to see what happened. So what I did is I just left them draining lights and fridges until everything turned itself off, including these LED lights. Okay, it actually, you can see it's going dull and bright and dull and bright. That's basically the LED not managing to get enough current. Now these are, these draw the tiniest amount of current. So you know when a battery is weak is when an LED can't cope then the battery is flat. So I thought, well, okay, I've killed the batteries. Now, normally a battery like this, if you, de if you discharged it this much, you could potentially destroy the battery, let alone flatten it. Just, you know, it would then just not accept any current. Lead crystal is supposed to be, handle be able to handle this very, very well. So what I thought I would do is kill the batteries and then charge them on a CTEC charger, which gives me a, it's, it's a 10 amp charger, but it can actually deliver, deliver more than 10 amps. And I left it on for precisely two minutes. Minutes. And this is the result. The CTEX charger's primary job is to charge this battery, and when then this battery is at capacity, then charge the other battery. So the current that the CTEX is producing is actually first topping up that battery before it tops up my auxiliary battery. I mention this because I'm just trying to get an idea of how eager the lead crystals are to absorb current. The fridge turned itself on uh, for about 10 minutes and then turned itself off again. Now it was reading 8.2 volts, now sitting at 10.8 volts with the fridge plugged in and the lights still burning. So with two minutes, just two, I can't believe this actually, just two minutes with a 10 amp charger, uh, gave it enough current to, and then all these lights went bright, the fridge turned on, and now is up by two volts uh, under load. I'm now gonna run the engine and see how quickly the battery recovers and how it accepts current. They're not live, uh, because they, they move all the time, so that's the Wi-Fi. Okay, it's absorbing 20 amps. The charger, through which the engine is charging it, can push as much as 40. At this low rate of charge state, it's not accepting 40, but it's accepting 20. So 50% of it's the capacity. I'm expecting this to go up very, very quickly. In fact, I can see it right now in front of me uh, going up. Slowly, but it is going up. This is also a good example of why you cannot tell the state of your batteries by the voltage. The voltage doesn't give you enough information on whether the the battery is healthy or not, or whether it is in a high state of charge or not. It's one of the indicators, but without current, um, it's, uh, it can be very misleading.
So you see, with even the the best system in the world, it's not accepting 40 amps. Um, when I tried it earlier, when it was in a low state of charge but not completely discharged, it accepted 40 amps straight away. Boom! Instantly, 42 amps are going into that battery right now. No hassle at all. It's not doing that now, but it's climbing very quickly. It's already up to 22 amps. So uh, what I'm saying is that when you kill even the best batteries that you can get, they don't accept the full current immediately. They have to be conditioned and good charging systems will do that for your battery. It's working. I'm now going to put the batteries on full charge for a couple of nights. Yeah, it's up to 23 already. So it is climbing and the engine's been running what? Four? Not even five minutes yet. Max tracks table. Now I have not changed my Max tracks. They're, I've actually got four of them. I've got the original orange ones down there and these beige ones. Now what I've de decided to do is not fit the extra Max tracks table. I'm trying to save weight. I'm already actually too heavy as far as I'm concerned I would like to be lighter so the extra max X table on the other side actually was just uh, it was too much so this particular product enables one to fit two or four max tracks so I just decided to fit four and not fit another table to the other side ah new stickers aren't they cool yeah they are cool I think they're cool the awning uh, looks a little bit different because the um, the bag is different. The original bag was uh, a, a shiny grey vinyl uh, that's a more attractive black but actually the shiny grey vinyl was easier to clean. Uh, this does look nicer. Uh, I'm not sure that really. What else? Ah the step. One of the things that I've lost by changing the bumper is the original Toyota bumper had a cut out here that allowed a very convenient step up into the back. Now this is a little bit too high for comfort. So my idea was to fit this step that I actually bought for the vehicle um, three, four years ago at Billings Land Rover Show in the UK. Billings is a huge Land Rover Fanatics market and that cost me all of 15 pounds. So, uh, and it really, really works well. But the trouble is that the way it's mounted here, it's loose, it's off center, it doesn't really work. So, Yucky from Quick Pitch saw it and said, nah, that's not good enough. So he's helping me out. So there it is. I think that works very, very nicely. In fact, it works so well, uh, that little uh, white stool that I took on canning stock and I've used on, on Holland and a few other trips, uh, I've left behind now because that is at exactly the right height and doesn't get in the way, of course. What I'd like to show you is my extremely sophisticated uh, but absolutely reliable method of measuring how much water I have in my water tank. I'm very proud of this invention. It's my own invention and I thought of it and it is mine. I'm about to fill up the tank. I want to find out how much I've got in there and how much I've used. And I can tell there uh, 10, 20, 30. I've got about 35, 38 litres left. So that is a full tank, 70 litres, about 75 litres, and that is my invention. Isn't it cool? The idea that a light is more than just, you know, better vision at night, that it actually looks good and it's quite cool, uh, particularly now with all the light bars and everything that are available, um, that hasn't escaped me. But, um, and if I think about it, my very first car, the very first thing I did with it, uh, apart from putting uh, putting a sound system in it was to put um, spot lamps on I wanted some lights that would be small so not interfere with the airflow into the radiator and I wanted a broad spread uh, with a little bit of range so that's what I purchased uh, I did a lot of research and finally a mate of mine in Seattle who had done so much research on light bars and LED lighting said to me, you've got two choices if you want the best. Light force, rigid. So I went for the rigid. This armrest I have uh, Velcroed down here and it clips in here. And I must say it makes a big difference from the driver's seat. Um, I don't put anything in it, but you can put something in it. And I got that from Dubai. 
I purchased it in a shop uh, called Real Real Outdoor. I've been onto their website. It looks like their website is closed, but uh, you're welcome to go and Google it if you're looking for one. And somebody told me that they found them for sale online in a, in a store in Saudi Arabia. So those are the only clues I have for this little door pouch. So I can't help you with more information on that one. And of course, I know that many of you will be asking the questions, did I have the rear axle widened? The answer is yes. That's on a separate video, and really, it was an eye-opener. At the end of each trip, it's uh, very normal for me to start. In fact, I do it before the end of each trip. Almost on my way home, the last leg of every big trip I do. And Trans Australia has taught me something about the vehicle, and that a certain design in the vehicle is a little bit frustrating. I was away for seven weeks. I was frustrated in that I didn't have enough time to stop and smell the roses. It was frantic. It was filming. It was filming, driving, filming, driving, filming, driving, filming, day after day after day after day. And it was, it was frustrating because I had a deadline to, to keep. Deadline, get back here so I could edit the programs, so I could then go to Africa which I will be doing very soon. By the time you see this video, I'm probably in Africa. In fact, almost certainly in Africa right now. And the trouble was, of course, I couldn't edit while on the road. And I can't do that in this vehicle. It's just too small inside. So to drive this vehicle and actually create content while on the road, is not a solvable solution with this vehicle. This doesn't mean that I'm going to get rid of it and get something else. I am in love with this truck. It is phenomenal. But I still have a hankering for the six-wheel drive. And my original concept, which was the, the six-wheel drive, multi-drive system, I saw one when I was in Geelong and just drooled all over it. This is the six-wheel drive that I drove in Oman. Those of you who have not seen that series of films about the uh, Land Cruiser six-wheel drive, the link is above. Um, what they had there was not what I would build, but the basis was there. That the, the, the fact that you have a vehicle that has that much payload, which means you can have a proper full camper, which means that with that camper, I can do a trip and I can actually produce, and I love the idea of that, to be able to actually produce content while I'm actually on the road, even broadcast it live. So in other words, do a little trip between towns, film, edit something together, put it together, and then broadcast it while I'm still on the road, actually live, oh, live on, on YouTube. That's my ultimate goal. So coming back to the fact that I, I want to do some changes to this vehicle and those things, things were, were kind of brewing in my mind as I was driving the final leg. That part I can't solve. But what I can solve is a few other issues. Other issues relating to uh, driver comfort. Uh, what I'm, I'm going to start doing it now. So I have no planned expeditions with this truck until next year, 2019. But I love working on it. So a Saturday morning such as this, typical of me, I'll come out to my workshop and I'll start working on my truck, truck in preparation for the trip ahead. Long term though, <clears throat> I was trying to work out today, this morning, how many Land Cruiser troop carriers were built, were, were bought, new ones were bought and then built on account of the videos that I've made about this beast. And I, I don't know how many it is, and it's very difficult. I know personally, and I've actually met the owners of four of them that were buying, going to buy something else. Um, I've met in Queensland and in Victoria, I met so many people that, had, that came to meet and greets. I bought my trophy because of you. There it is, brand, brand, brand new. They built it. They've done very similar conversions 
to mine. I would love to know how much that is, that many is. If you watch this video and you, and you did, and you bought a troopy, old or new, as a result of what you saw me building, please go and get in contact with me or even just comment below. Just say, I did. Okay, Any, I just need to get some numbers. And the reason for this is that I, if I have the influence on the market that I think I have, I don't know what it is. I think it's significant. I want to build a six-wheel drive, but I don't have the money to go and buy a six-wheel drive, and I ain't selling this. My long-term goal for this, actually, if I do do a six-wheel drive, is this goes to Africa for two or three years, and then I'll bring it back. Um, I want a six-wheel drive, and I want to be able to do my Australian expeditions from a, with a camper where I can actually edit and produce content while I'm actually on the road. For me to do that, I need to get the backing of those people that would benefit from me doing such a thing and get them to help me. It's as simple as that. So please, if you, yeah, if you got a tribute because of me, please, just, I need to have some numbers. And if you want to give me extra details, That'll be great. If you want to contact me on my email address, send me details, go onto my website, contact me via the su support um, on my email address. I will get the email and I will respond to you. Thank you. This is the Javanese rubber plant. It grows on the tiny island of Wiggy Woggy Woggy in the South Pacific. <laughs> this is the Javanese rubber plant. It grows on the tiny island of Wiggy Woggy Woggy. <laughs> I can't do this.